And yeah, let's dive right in. There's a bunch of things to talk about, I guess. Um, first off, like some background. I, uh, I'm David. Uh, I'm a freelance software developer and um, I work on Arch Linux as a maintainer, but also developer and um, one of the main signing keys uh, for the distribution. Um, I have like, I don't know, my fields of interest are usually like pro audio, Rust, uh, Python things, but also infrastructure related things, packaging in general, um, and the installation process. Um, so yeah, the ob obligatory, uh, basically for Luca, this is just to uh, appease you a little bit. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, who of you actually uses Arch in here, maybe just to get like a rough uh, understanding? It's like yeah, it's like maybe 10, 15 percent roughly. Uh, then I, I'll do like a little bit of overview at least. So uh, Arch basically has a uh, its own package management system. Um, it's based on Pacman. Um, that's the package manager. We have Make PKG that's used for building packages. Um, yeah, mostly this this entire distribution packaging setup it contains or it consists of like PKG builds that are the build scripts to build from. Um, you have dev tools in our case that is the distribution uh, distribution specific tooling that we use for for building the packages in our distribution um, and we have um, a set of scripts basically called DB scripts that uh, are taking care of the repository management um, some of you are probably familiar with the AUR that's the arch user repository that's basically a, a large collection of build scripts for packages. Um, out of those, a few people build their own unofficial user repositories that are then like binary repositories, basically. Um, and for all of this, a lot of like AUR helpers exist that basically uh, enable to make that a little more painless. Um, the package repositories are usually consisting of the artifacts that we pre-built, so the packages. Um, we um, or take the, the general setup, you can also yeah, refer to these videos here, they're from last year basically, where I explain this in a bit, uh, more detail. Um, we have optional uh, the, the ability to yeah, use detached open PGP signatures for, for this to um, verify signatures. Uh, the signing depends solely on the, the owner of the repository basically, whether they want or do not want to use signing and uh, the artifact verification on the user side depends on the configuration of the package management system. So that is also, you can switch it off if you want to basically. Um, yeah, simplified, this looks roughly like this um, for the person maintaining the repository and uh, for the person trying to use it, uh, they need to basically download first like a, uh, an open PGP certificate, import that and then validate um, ongoing uh, packages with it. Um, this is all based on like the verification scheme that, that Pacman provides basically for, for this purpose. Um, there's lots of uh, ugly stuff to be had here, I guess. We have a system-wide mutable uh, GNU PG keyring that resides in Etsy and that's not very pretty. As you can imagine, that's super brittle, unfortunately. Um, we do um, the entire uh, signature verification scheme based on uh, PGP KI, or as most of you probably know it as the Web of Trust. Um, the packager certificates and the trust anchors are all maintained in custom tooling, basically, that we have for this. Um, the largest downside, in my opinion, is that Pacman doesn't really distinguish between whether you use that keyring to verify um, any of these repositories. So it uses the same keyring for all repositories. Um, and it also does not offer a distinction between verification of the repository metadata, uh, usually it's called in our case uh, sync databases, and uh, the package files. So um, there's no real distinction on the Pacman side for this. Generally, when we talk about packages um, or packaging on Arch, we really have to look into or like how we verify things uh, in, a, in a more detailed scope, I guess. We have uh, five main signing keys that establish this PGP KI. By default, you need uh, at least three. Um, we have 64 individual packages that are able to sign packages. 
um, and they have access to the extra repository. There's 24 of those are developers that have access to the core repository as well. Um, generally, I would say that we do an okay job in like, you know, our use of OpenPGP, although it is, it is tedious work sometimes uh, by, um, yeah, verif verifying upstream sources, etc. But uh, we are pretty lenient on or pretty strict on the source verification from which we built, uh, because it's all with signed tags, etc. Um, we do, um, well, binary package verification on the client side, of course. Um, and also of the um, deployment artifacts, it's like installation media, etc. Um, there it gets a little less nicely integrated, but I'll get to that in a bit. Um, and there's sadly not a good job being done currently on repository sync database signing and verification. Um, yeah, generally the, the workflow is basically packages built on a machine in a clean CH root that's built, uh, based on uh, well, an endspawn container. Um, we encourage all packages to use OpenPGP card devices um, to, to yeah, prevent key exfiltration. Um, although in our use case currently all packages have access to the repository server, uh, which is like a central, uh, yeah, a central facility, and that's kind of yikes. Um, we have um, also no repository sync database signing. Uh, as of now, it means all the packages are signed, but the sync databases that basically uh, provide the state of the repository um, that is not signed. Um, yeah, package maintainer workflow is roughly like this. Uh, you, you have access to n build machines, and you have also access to the repository server as a packager. Uh, we do have other artifacts that are built in slightly different ways, in some ways. Uh, we have virtual machine images that we produce on a weekly basis. They're built in CI, they're automatically signed in CI as well, but with a software key in CI. So that's, uh, that's that. Um, the installation media is built on a monthly basis, on the other hand, um, and that is then uh, done manually and signed manually and uploaded manually, etc. There's a lot of manual steps involved, sadly. Mm. Yeah, in general, the difference between the two is that the virtual machines are being pulled off of releases on GitLab, so that's a, a big plus. We don't really need like any SSH access or whatever from CI towards the repository server. That's a good scheme improvement, I guess. Whereas when you look at the release workflow for the installation media, it's all push-based, basically. So, yeah, you might wonder, like, what's the motivation for even uh, yeah, improving any of this? I guess probably I, I gave a few <laughs> ideas. Um, we definitely want to prevent key exfiltration, of course. Um, that is something we currently cannot guarantee, because although we encourage people to use hardware tokens, we cannot really know whether they do. So they may rely on software keys on their side, right? Um, same goes for private key material in CI, it can be exfiltrated. Um, and if you yeah, think about like the larger scope, you know, like 64 versus just one system that you need to guard against uh, malicious access, it's much, much easier to, to do that just for one. Um, and uh, yeah, going forward, we of course want to automate all the things um, as anyone else wants to. Um, and for that, we want to have an easier way to do package build automation, but also mass rebuilds, etc. Much of that is very manual currently. Um, and signing of repository sync databases needs to be automated, and uh, yeah, <coughs> installation media and uh, virtual machines as well. So uh, currently, we are we're looking at goals that we're trying to solve first, like the virtual machine signing and the installation media, and then dig our way uh, deeper into the stack. And yeah, that's where we arrive at SignStar, which is basically um, our yeah, currently um, sought a solution for, for this entire um, problem scape that we have. Um, we want to try and have a system that is secure but also maintainable. Uh, that is quite important. Uh, the robustness of it is, of course, like a pretty high goal as well because boring 
in fact, is good because um, if stuff doesn't break, then you, you don't have to sweat. That's great. Um, we want to maintain the current way that we built uh, existing uh, packages, etc., um, as in maintaining the open PGP uh, based workflow that we have as of now. Uh, for that, we're looking at a standards compliant implementation of OpenPGP, which GNU-PG is actually not. Um, and, uh, well, so we, let's look at like, the setup that is a bit more like of interest, actually, for this entire thing. Um, for something like this, you're basically looking at a hardware security module that will contain all your keys. And in our case, we have Rust-based integration for this, which is very good. Um, and um, on the other side, you also have something that actually needs to front this because most of the HSMs are somewhat limited in the way that you can authenticate against them. Um, and that's where a dedicated physical host comes in with, um, in our case, a custom image-based operating system that we're currently building, um, that where we're targeting strong authentication and um, we want to provide like dedicated and very coherent tools that fit into that framework, basically. Um, additionally, of course, you want to have clients to all of this. You want to have some easy way of actually requesting a signature for some payload, and uh, you want to create those digital signatures. Uh, when we look at the hardware security module, then um, the thing that we came up with is currently using the NitroKey NetHSM because, um, A, it's open source. The well, the entire operating system is open source. It's pretty great. Uh, it has a documented API. It has an auto-generated set of bindings uh, of which we use the Rust bindings currently. Um, it does provide a container image for testing purposes, which is also very great. Um, we have started building custom integration for this at the beginning of the year. Um, it's like a high level, pretty extensively documented um, library crate um, called NetHSM. Uh, you can check it out there. Uh, we also created a dedicated command line tool for it. So the entire API is actually covered by this. Um, we have OpenPGP support since version 04 of the NetHSM crate, thanks to Victor, who's uh, sitting over there. If you want to talk uh, OpenPGP, uh, he's, he's the person. <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, because of the container, uh, image that is available to us, we can fully integration test the entire thing, which is very good. Um, so when we look at like something like the HSM, our current threat model is basically that um, we, uh, well, we, we think that the given HSM is a um, sufficiently tamper-proof device that prevents any key exfiltration, otherwise we wouldn't be able to use it. Um, that we can store backups of the uh, HSM state uh, in a, in a yeah, securely offline for yeah, recovering basically purposes and um, that we can have credentials that are required for all the administrative actions uh, that we need to do for setting it up and for, for changing anything in the configuration, um, that this can also be stored securely offline. Um, our current um, the aimed workflow is to use like a Shamil secret sharing approach to kind of divide this onto a set of dedicated people um, so that they collectively can basically be reconfiguring or configuring the device um, as, as we use it. Um, for physical hosts, we have some basic requirements, that, uh, let's say, uh, so we are looking at UEFI and Secure Boot uh, with UKI because that way we can more easily ensure the integrity of, of the operating system. Uh, we do um, require TPM2 um, support because we have a, uh, the requirement for an encrypted VAR partition um, where we store the secret for the WireGuard um, tunnel. I'm going to explain that a bit later. And um, yeah to also be able to have user configuration in that place. The physical con uh, connection uh, between the host and the HSMs is um, probably best explained in, yeah, in this one. Um, so we want to have this um, physical host be publicly accessible to certain hosts that we, we can configure, and um, the backend not at all, because that is just in a private network range, basically.
for this entire purpose, we've started building an image-based OS called uh, SignStar OS. This is like really in its infancy uh, currently. We do um, have a, a small like basic system set up for a read-only root file system that looks uh, encrypted var. That's uh, basically with a TPM enrolled key. Um, we use uh, systemd repart on first boot to set most of these things up. Um, it's based on an AB updated uh, system scheme using sysupdate. Um, on first boot, this is currently not yet implemented. We um, want to create like a, a WireGuard setup that we then use for diverting logs and metrics uh, down the line. Um, this all comes with a read-only configuration that does not, that basically just gives like the, the rough layout of the user configuration for the HSM that um, any system user may uh, then um, properly uh, yeah, authenticate with and communicate with t for certain actions. Um, more on that in a little bit. Um, yeah, all of this is actually built using MKOSI. Uh, big thanks to Dan, who's not here, uh, um, for all the help. We actually documented this particular setup uh, because it took us some time to figure out. Um, Generally, um, when you look at like a deployment of, of something like this, then um, usually you want to be able to have it hands off and not really accessible after after you deploy it, right? Uh, it should be very single purpose in a way. Um, and in this way, like a, um, an image-based solution really provides here uh, and shines in that particular case because we can basically just um, yeah, DD an image onto onto a drive, uh, have it boot, and it will reconfigure the drive, um, set up the var partition, etc. Uh, create create the WireGuard credentials, uh, which we then can download, uh, configure the WireGuard tunnel, and have logging established. Basically, um, yeah. Shortly after that, we basically want to have a look at the connected HSMs uh, and configure those in case they are yet unprovisioned and um, create these administrative uh, credentials that I talked about earlier, uh, slice them up using uh, Shami secret sharing, and then provide them to designated, uh, well, logins, basically, on that system. And only after they have been downloaded, basically, configure the HSMs with those. Uh, when you, we talk about like the, the logging aspect, then it's probably good to see that um, the NetHSM provides um, well syslog diversion capabilities. We need to catch those with syslog and G, and then uh, stuff that into Promptail. We were also thinking about uh, doing uh, journal D namespaces, but it's unfortunately not not something that uh, syslog and G really provides. Um, and uh, yeah, same for the operating system, we can stuff that into Promptail and then have that on a, on a designated uh, logging server. Um, the metrics via Prometheus work kind of similarly, also over WireGuard then. Um, uh, there are some uh, very specific uh, setups needed to, to provide this though um, with the NetHSM that are partially done, but uh, still need to do, yeah, we still need to do some work on those. Uh, Authentication-wise, we thought we would go actually very lean and uh, simple uh, by just relying on something that's already there mostly uh, by using OpenSSH uh, because you can provide it with pretty hardened configurations. Uh, you can have clients that rely on TPM2-backed keys. Morten is giving the talk in the other room about this actually right now. Um, we can have system-wide authorized keys that are then read-only because the rootfs is read-only and we enforce commands for the login sh uh, and in instead of having a login shell for any of the users. Mm, roughly this looks like um, this where we basically have a system user that tries to log in. Um, whatever the um, the operation towards the HSM is, is then uh, is, there's like a configuration that maps the user to another and a dedicated user on the HSM the um, operation towards the HSM is done with that user returned, and yeah, um, so it's fairly fairly basic actually. Mm, some of you have seen this probably already. It's like an easy way to force commands depending on users that try to log in. Um, we do have 
the need for a lot of dedicated uh, tooling in this case, though, because we don't use like an I don't know like a like a, a REST API or so. Um, in this case, we have designated users that are uh, made available or forced to use these tools. Um, some of these are for, for downloading certain things like a signature or the backup file from the HSM or um, a key certificate because we need those for open PGP support, for instance. Um, especially interesting is probably then, uh, well, not only the metrics, but most likely the, the secret share download because that is then used for the designated shareholders of the secret uh, to get to the uh, share of the secret. Um, and this is also how we download the, the WireGuard configuration. Um, the good thing about this is basically that a lot of these tools can be, can be very lean and very small um, and only offer that particular dedicated feature that we want from them basically based on a configuration format. Um, so it's the same for uploading certain things like upload, uh, uploading backups, uh, a share of the secret or an update for the HSM. Um, oops. Ah. We have tooling that is run only on the host, uh, either during during build time when we want to configure the system to be able to expose those users and the configurations for them, and also um, the configuration tooling that is used to actually put this translation configuration that I was uh, aiming at earlier here basically in place, and. Um, it allows us to have, um, yeah, uh, the HSM be configured and at the same time have system users be able to use those configured users of the HSM. Generally speaking, and this is getting a little long, sorry for that in advance, the threat model of, of this um, is still like an evolving target. Um, we have a dedicated physical host that manages all the access, of course. Um, and uh, none of the HSM facilities are actually exposed to, to the net, to the wider net. Um, the host is not really yeah, accessible by system users. Uh, oh, it's not, oh, I'm confusing myself here. Oh yeah, the, the login shell is not really um, a thing during runtime. You, you cannot really log in, on, also not as an administrator, etc. Um, we have dedicated credentials for stuff like uh, getting to um, the WireGuard connection set up, like the, the, the public key for that, uh, the metrics and, and locks, etc. Um, yeah, as pointed out earlier, we have a, a setup that is pretty lean on having any state actually, and that state is encrypted, uh, particularly specific to that machine. Um, the kind of ugly thing or kind of not really thought out thing yet is how to really guard like the um, key material for cryptographic signing when you build the image uh, because we enroll a user-based key into into that system uh, when, we, when we build the image it's getting enrolled uh, on first boot and uh, we need to keep using that key, of course. Uh, we need to have like a hardware-backed solution for that as well, um, because it's used for secure boot and verity signing in that case. Um, as that is obviously a problem if, if this key gets leaked, we also want to have some form of quality gate, of course, um, like release channels come to mind there for, for this type of purpose, for the updates then. Mm. Yeah, as pointed out earlier, we want to rely on Shamir's secret sharing for the administrative creden uh, credentials. Um, and these are not really persisted on that system. They're really only in TempFS for some time for the configuration action and then deleted again. Um, all the unprivileged actions such as operator level things like creating a signature, um, they are only ever uh, persisted in the um, yeah, encrypted partition. Mm, we create a backup after each reconfiguration and that is then downloaded. So yeah, it's, it's very long, I'm very sorry. <laughs> um, if a yeah, shareholder loses access or is compromised, that is obviously a problem and should ideally be mitigated. 
Um, this is basically as easy as changing the configuration of the image that you're building uh, as an update image and uh, providing that to that host again and it will update, remove access for that particular person um, and you can even rotate the, the keys of course at that point just to be safe. Um, it gets more ugly if n out of m keys um, of, um, or sh shares of those um, of that um, secret get get compromised, because then you actually only need access to the backups. So it's good to keep those separate from people that actually have shares, um, and um, well, to potentially yeah uh, have access to any other NetHSM or that. NetHSM directly, you, you could potentially sign things with that, of course, or reconfigure it in the worst case also. Um, yeah, generally we have three unprivileged users on that target system, that's operators, metrics, and backup users um, that are not able to, to change other users uh, or their own passphrases or anything like that, or their own access rights or anything. Um, and um, this is all yeah, mapped to system users on that host, of course. Uh, if credentials for any of these system host, uh, system host um, users is, is compromised, then we, we can only have them uh, yeah, compromise that particular action. So you can only, for instance, download a backup or get the metrics or sign with that particular user's key. Um, in general, it works just as here, basically. Once you have um, the reconfiguration in place, you can just cut off the credentials of that particular user, redeploy an update, and the system will not grant access to that user anymore. Um, we believe that yeah, uh, monitoring is quite essential, of course, of, of this, this particular host. Um, this is all done in a, in a, in a dedicated outside facility. Um, we want to do uh, well transparency log integration eventually. This is definitely on our roadmap. Um, and we want to monitor that uh, long term, of course, to ensure that what we've actually been pushing into the repositories, for instance, has actually been signed by us and not by some random other person. Um, but this is really outside of the context of this particular project. So you earned an ice cream, it was long, I'm sorry. Um, now we could look at it. Uh, the client hosts. They have kind of similar requirements, I would say. Um, ideally, in my opinion, it would actually be great to also have a, um, an image-based solution there because that would be safer. Um, we also want to have TPM2 uh, of course, because we want to have hardback SSH keys. Again, watch that talk by Morton in the other room uh, later on. Um, for this client, we basically only provide like one tool. Um, this is to request a signature. Um, Victor has been working on a, a very interesting solution um, towards lightweight uh, payloads, um, because the usual way of doing this is to provide an entire file to a signing service and then that being relatively heavy sometimes. If you push like gigabytes into a host, uh, that is really uh, yeah, grounds for congestion very quick. Um, I think like the Seagull uh, service has issues like that from time to time, depending on like the rebuilds, etc. Mm. Yeah, here, here the threat model is kind of that we want to have dedicated credentials, of course, for this action particularly. Uh, ideally, TPM backed. Um, we have a bunch of stuff that we built. A lot of that stuff might not be super safe to build. Uh, hence, it is not unlikely that a build service might eventually be compromised and we need to redeploy it or kill it or whatever. Um, so, for this purpose, we at least assume that we can switch it off. Uh, we also assume that we can remove these credentials in a very timely manner from the signing service itself by just redeploying an update. 
Digital signatures are currently, as I mentioned earlier, only aiming, on, uh, aiming at uh, OpenBGP support uh, because that's what we're using at, at this point. Um, but as the signing is not really, it's not, I mean, it's kind of uh, just a framing basically for um, cryptographic signatures. We may have support for SSH or PKCS11 or anything else basically in the future. Um, currently, we assume that we um, have metadata in signatures that somewhat describe the environment in which they were created. Um, yeah, being able to identify the entities that were involved, basically. And that we can have a tap on, like, who is uh, requesting that signature, of course. Um, if the client host is, yeah, uh, um, compromised, we will also want to be able to either switch it off or... Um, yeah, re remove basically the, the access to uh, the signing service. Um, generally, we have, um, yeah, then to identify anything that has been signed, this is mostly only possible with some external feature like a, an, a tr transparency lock. Um, we need to rebuild certain things potentially. Depending on the severity, we may have to redeploy certain aspects like the, the build, uh, build host, for instance, or parts of the key, maybe we need to even revoke the key, which is more unlikely in my opinion. Um, in general, there's still a lot to do, as you can imagine, it's kind of like an enterprise scale uh, endeavor that we are on currently. Um, we still have a bunch of like, uh, yeah, basic features and components that we need to write. Uh, a lot of the groundwork has been done already. We need to write an RFC to basically acknowledge that we want to pursue this because we will be replacing a lot of people's workflows going forward with that in our distribution. Uh, we need to buy a bunch of devices. That's, uh, of course, also on the list. Uh, have a test deployment before we roll this out, and we have a bunch of nice-to-haves um, that we want to pursue. There are um, yeah, certain missing features, like the configuration format is not fixed yet uh, for this uh, the dedicated client, but also uh, like signing tools, etc. Um, the yeah, the lightweight uh, signature format that is also still in, in a merge request, uh, but is due to be merged soon, I guess. Uh, the logging and metrics integration is more like a DevOps type of uh, workload, I guess, uh, but needs to be done as well. And uh, we have to write a bunch of dedicated executables that I outlined earlier. Um, yeah, there's a lot of uh, things to be had probably in the threat model still. Um, these keep changing the, the more we progress through this project basically because you realize more and more like what is actually a feasible solution or what is not. Um, there are yeah, open questions around like the whole security, like physical access security, um, administrative um, compromise, etc. Um, we want to, of course, hook into uh, an attestation lock uh, um, facility like Wakor eventually. This is certainly not something we will do in the first iteration, though. Um, down the line, as um, Arch Linux does not provide any um, well, secure boot uh, integration out of the box, so we don't have a, sh a signed shim, we definitely want that for the installation process eventually. That would be really good. Um, the signing scheme is somewhat weird because it doesn't so easily integrate with something like this. Um, we may have to rely on the dedicated PKCS11 driver that is provided by Upstream. Um, there are certain ideas also around like threshold signing that could be done eventually because we have a reproducible builds effort um, in which, uh, yeah, we have like, I think like, always over 70% is like reproducible, but they're like hard targets that are not easily getting reproduced. Um, in such a model, we would basically um, only provide a signature if N out of M machines can reproduce that particular package or payload or whatever, and only then provide a signature. It's basically a quality gatekeeping, so to speak. Yeah. So. You can find uh, all the slides here if you want. Um, 
there's links into a lot of stuff uh, in there uh, and mermaids you can click on um, yeah you can find all my contact details here and if you have any questions uh, I'd be happy to talk questions yes So you talked about this image-based OS for the designer machine, but then how do you build this image, and how do you know that you can trust it? How, how I build it? Yeah. Cur currently, it's using uh, Make OSI to to build that image. But I mean, do you run it just on your laptop, or where does it come from? C currently, it's built only only like in a, in a test environment. We, we're not. Uh, it's basically just there for testing purposes to outline like what we want to stuff into it how we want to design it. So like the basic features of that exist, but it's uh, something that is not integrated. That's largely to some degree because some features of MakeOSI that we need for that are not yet released. Uh, and only then we will set up CI to get to reproducibility of that, etc. Um, interesting talk by Jelle, who's sadly not in this talk right now, but he talked about reproducibility of uh, MakeOSI based images earlier today. Oh, no, yesterday, I think, yeah. Thanks. Other question, yes? Thank you for the... Thank you for the talk. Um, I was wondering, you mentioned that uh, some projects will be deprecated by this effort. Can you go into detail? What's the repercussions for the Arch Linux infrastructure when this goes live? Uh, I'm, I'm not entirely sure if really a lot of stuff will be deprecated. I think the most things for, for Arch that will change is actually that um, eventually people will have less manual workflows actually because currently like the, the, the package build workflow is very manual, like the signing process around that and it's like each packager on their own. It's, it's kind of, it's ugly that way. Um, so I, I honestly only see like benefits currently to, to that. Um, also, in, with regards to building other artifacts, basically, most of that is either manual or done in CI already, but not in a safe way. Um, so, yeah, it's, I think it's a pretty great improvement eventually. Other question, yes. Uh, maybe I misunderstood. So, uh, when a developer logs into that system to sign some stuff, and on the signing system, there is basically a password which is used to authenticate with the HSM. That's roughly how it works, uh, but no one actually gets like a um, an it, actual. That, that's inaccessible to the. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that never gets accessed. Uh, you, you you can't really get to it uh, as the user that logs in. For for other HSMs, I've seen models where mm. the user of the HSM authenticates a request with a signature by a local token or we are some set challenge response mechanism so that the HSM knows it is actually talking to an authenticated user mm -hmm. via some challenge response mechanism. But how would this be different from having like a passphrase of a user um, or did you mean that in, in, a, in a scope of like having an authenticated specific host that it talks to only or so? Uh, a specific user may be authenticated with a smart card mm. locally in the moment where the user wants to sign something. Ah, okay. So, so the HSM knows that this is not some leaked credential because it's mm. bound to a hardware token. Yeah. Yeah. This is this is then really t basically taken ca taken care of uh, in the configuration of the operating system because that assigns particular um, users a particular um, a login, a system login, right? Uh, so the, you, you can't really mix and match them, but it's, it's really like dedicated. So the, the central configuration takes place in the SignStar OS um, host, basically, in that case. Um, I, I think I, I can clarify, yeah. because uh, this, this, solution will be, this solution will be coupled with the build service. So it wouldn't be the developer requesting a signature. It would be the build service creating a package and requesting the signature. And the build service will be uh, running with a TPM, so there won't be any passwords. There mm. will be just hardware back, uh, backed keys just to connect and just to request a signature from the HSM. But there are no passwords in, in here. The password is on the signing server. Uh, 
Tem there temporarily, are just public yeah. keys, public keys, cryptography. The, the key to connect to the server is in the TPM. So just like you said with the uh, YubiKey or something like that, the, there are no passwords, there are connections through uh, SSH that are authenticated with public key cryptography. Uh, I hope that clarifies a bit. Uh, I think I, I think <laughs> I, I think I have a uh, somewhere have a graph about this. Ah, here it is. Basically, so um, you have you have like the client, which in in, the, in our case will be like a build machine that is also sealed uh, um, with a TPM backed key that authenticates against the the SignStar OS host. Um, the executable that it's allowed to call it basically just remaps the user that it uh, it uses then to call the NetHSM with basically, but you don't really get access to that particular passphrase or anything. Plus, that passphrase is just rotated on every on every reconfiguration, and it's it's only residing in um, the encrypted var partition in that case. Any other question? Going once. Oh, well, I have a question. Oh, no. So, <laughs> uh, on, in other distributions, we have like the archive keying. Mm -hmm. In Arch, you saw you have a per packager keying. No, I try to. I like to have distributions being able to bootstrap other distributions. And packaging the Arduino keying is such a pain. Can you have an archive keying? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's that's the interesting that's thing. A, that's actually enabling that eventually down the road because we will, going forward, not have dozens of individual keys anymore, but we will have long-lived keys that have no expiration. Uh, one of the downsides of our current model is basically that individuals hold specific open PGP keys with a, an expiration, and you need to continuously stay on like this m mean of, a, you know, of an updated key ring all the time, otherwise uh, there might be keys in there that are outdated already or not, not currently valid, um, and that, that will be fixed by that approach. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any other question? Going once, going twice. Thank you.